There's a really heartbreaking study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have you can call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it decades ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none. It's not the average, but it's the most common answer. And I thought a lot about that in so many of the places I've been in the United States. I interviewed and got to know an incredible man called Professor John Cassiopo. He's a world expert on loneliness. He's at the University of Chicago. And Professor Cassiopo explained to me, you know, if you think about the circumstances where human beings evolved, right? We evolved, the reason why you're able to watch this through your laptop or wherever you're watching it, the reason why we exist is because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down, but they were much better at cooperating than them. Every human instinct human beings have is to be part of a cooperative tribe, right? Bees need a hive, humans need a tribe. And if you think about the circumstances where human beings evolved, if you were separated from the group, you would become depressed and anxious for an incredibly good reason. You were in terrible danger. You were probably about to die. Those are the instincts we still have. Yet we've told ourselves a story that we can live without tribes. We are the first human beings ever to try to live without communities. To imagine that like some cowboy on the horizon, and even the cowboys didn't do it this way, we can live alone, we can be alone. That, that's not the species we are. And it's causing, and Professor Cassiopo has proven that this loneliness epidemic is one of the key causes of the epidemic of depression and anxiety that we have across our society. And I was really interested to find, well, who has acted on that? Who's tried to find an antidepressant for the loneliness crisis? I met an incredible man, one of the heroes of my book, Lost Connections, called Sam Everington. Sam's a doctor in East London, one of the poorest parts of East London, actually, where I lived for many years. And Sam was really uncomfortable because he had loads of patients coming to him who were depressed and anxious. And he'd been told in his training, even though he knew the science was much more sophisticated than this, to tell people, well, you feel this way because you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain and just give them drugs. Like me, Sam is not opposed to those drugs. He's, he's in favor of them, but he just thought this is, this is not enough. This isn't solving the reason why these people are depressed and anxious. He could see how lonely and cut off they were. So he pioneered a different approach. And I'll tell you about it through one of the patients of his that I got to know. A woman called Lisa Cunningham came to Sam. Lisa had been shut away in her home for seven years, crippling anxiety and depression. She came to Sam and Sam said to her, don't worry Lisa, I'll carry on giving you the drugs, whatever you need. I'm also gonna prescribe something different. I'm gonna prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the um, doctor surgery that was known as Dog Crap Alley, right? Which gives you a sense of what it was like. They didn't use the word crap, I'm being polite. Um, it was just an area of scrubland. And what Sam said is, what I'd like you to do is twice a week, I'd like you to meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people. We'll turn out and support you. And I'd like you to just turn this into something beautiful. The first meeting, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety. So many of the other people there were shaking. And they started talking to each other. They didn't know anything about gardening. They were inner city people from, from East London. As the weeks and months and then years went by, they taught themselves gardening. They had something to talk about that wasn't how terrible they felt. They could reconnect with the natural world. There's incredible evidence that interacting with the natural world is one of the most powerful natural antidepressants we have. And as human beings do when we're in groups, they started to solve each other's problems. There was a, a guy in the group who was sleeping on the night bus. Lisa thought, well, of course you're depressed, you're sleeping on a bus. She's outraged. Her and some other people in the group started pressuring the local authorities to get him housing. They succeeded. It was the first thing they'd done for someone else in years. It made them feel better than doing anything for themselves. And the way Lisa put it to me, as the flowers began to bloom, they began to bloom. There was a study in Norway, which is part of a growing body of research of a very similar program, that found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for an obvious reason. It's dealing with the reasons why they were so depressed and anxious in the first place. Everywhere I went in the world, I found that the most effective strategies with depression and anxiety were the places that were dealing with these deeper causes. Mm -hmm.